Thank you very much. And I'm excited to offer um, some advice and, and certainly open up some discussion concerning what has become one of the most popular aspects in implant dentistry today. Um, so, you know, I just want to let everyone know that what I want to do tonight is kind of shed some light on how I approach the fixed detachable prosthesis. There's a lot of different people that have different takes on how they do it. I and mean, we're going to cover how I do it and where I stand on certain areas when we talk about this treatment of hybrid prosthesis. So when I look at treatment planning, the edential, smaxil, and mandible, you know, for my patients, it really comes down to pretty much three basic approaches or options. Number one, we talk about overdentures, either by being stabilized or supported by conventional implants or small diameter implants. Or we talk about the traditional conventional ceramic metal fixed prosthesis, which was really for many, many years, the only fixed option that we had for a lot of our patients. And then of course, tonight's topic is, which is really the, uh, the fixed detachable prosthesis, the all on X. And we'll talk about what the X means and, and how I define X with my patients when I consider trying to um, establish uh, successful outcomes and meet patient expectations. So when we look at the fixed detachable prosthesis, for the most part, we're, we're talking about a patient population that is either edentulous already, or I find even a larger part of this population are the patients that are suffering with just a several or a few remaining hopeless teeth that have a very poor prognosis. And that seems to me where that's where the majority of our patients are coming into that are really looking for some sort of fixed detachable prosthesis. We're going to talk tonight about the survival rates and a historical perspective the areas of discussion and how I kind of feel where I lie in some of these um, areas. And then we're going to really just concentrate on one case presentation from the diagnosis to the treatment planning to the surgical and prosthetic aspect. And then I think that's going to be a very good kind of solid foundation. And from that point, everybody can continue to really research and look into the different approaches to this very exciting modality. You know, when I started in dental in implant dentistry, it was in the early 90s. You know, this is one of the most common statements that was made at the podium that implant dentistry is a prosthetically driven discipline with a surgical component. And many of us kind of took it for granted. We said, oh, yeah, that's true, that's true. But in reality, I'm not necessarily that we really believed it. You know, most of the the uh, approaches were being really dictated by the by the surgeon. And, and I will tell you that when we look at the fixed detachable prosthesis, this statement is so, so critically important. It's not something that we just say, but it's we truly have to believe this because essentially the way I look at these cases is that this is a denture procedure. I mean, we have to really understand tooth position. We have to understand, you know, incisal edge position, M sounds, E sounds. We have to really understand all this in order for this to be successful because in the end, we want to make sure that the patient is totally happy with the aesthetics and we really want to make sure that we make some critical decisions at the diagnosis as well as the treatment plan to make sure that that transition between the natural and anatomy of our patient and the prosthesis is not visible. And that's probably, again, that's very important. So knowing where the incisal edge is, and how that relates to, let's say, ultimately the alveoplasty, which is going to be the reduction of the bone, in order to hide that transition is critically important. To just see a patient, see some hopeless teeth, refer the patient to a surgeon to have them take out the teeth and put in four or five or six implants, and then hope that when you develop your, your prosthesis that that transition um, zone is hidden is really not the approach that we want to take. We want to make sure that we know exactly where those teeth belong, that exactly that that patient is very comfortable with what they look like. We want to make sure vertical dimensions established, and at that point, then we can have our patient go to perform the surgery, whether we do our own surgery or we have a team approach and have someone else do that surgery, but that is a very important part. And so this statement that I heard back in 1992 has um, certainly hit home more now with this type of prosthesis than anything else that I've done in implant dentistry. Now, the advantages for the fixed detachable is that it's a graftless procedure. And in other words, we're talking about that we're avoiding classic sinus augmentation. And for that, carries a lot of um, good things about it. We do see high survival rates. It's fixed, and we will find that that population of patients, let's say the baby boomers, the individuals that really don't want to 
live with a removable prosthesis, this becomes a very, very sought after prosthesis. It's cost effective, especially when we compare it to traditional crown and bridge on abutments and crowns and whatnot. So it again, makes it much more affordable for many patients, whereas maybe in the past they would alter, end up going with some sort of removable option. And then because we're not doing sinus augmentation and because we're not doing a lot of grafting and, and whatnot, there seems to be less complications. And so that, again, carries, uh, again, better success rates and better outcomes and at the same time meet patient expectations, which is really why we're, we're all in this game. When we look at the, the history, obviously this is not a new approach. In 1977, you know, Brandemart, this was kind of everything that, that all the prosthetic uh, options were really pretty much the fixed detachable design. We placed implants, we connected it to the patient's existing denture, and that was really the, the way we did all of our cases. So for many, many years, the fixed detachable prosthesis was really the, the go-to prosthesis for treating the edentulous patient, especially in the mandibular arch. In 2003, Malo again reintroduced the concept with the fixed detachable with the all on four. And so really, again, since, 19, since 2003, that's kind of been the rebirth of the fixed detachable prosthesis. We look at the historical success rates. When we look at the mandible, we see that we see about 97 to 100% success rates based on Malo's and Aguilardi's research. We look at the maxilla, as we would expect, the success rates are still very high, but still a little bit less than the mandible. And this, again, is consistent to all of our implant procedures. We always tend to see higher success rates in the mandible than we do in the maxilla. And again, uh, we do see that success rates. Now, one of the things is, is we do see that the, the bulk or the majority of the research that exists out there, when we look at retrospective, prospective studies, the majority of them are done by just a handful of practitioners, to story, Aguilardi's, and Malo's group. So we do have to keep that in mind that a lot of the research that's being published is being published by a few individuals, but, in, but even though we do see tremendous success rates um, among those practitioners with a high volume of implants and prostheses fabricated. Now, when I look at this, uh, this uh, approach, the fixed detachable approach, there are areas of discussion. When I, when I talk to many individuals and I look at the research, there's a whole group of different, different approaches that, you know, different people um, either get involved with, other areas uh, they may select not to get involved in. So when I look at the areas of discussion from my point of view, first of all, we talk about, is it all on four or are we going to do more implants? Are we going to use a CBCT? If so, are we going to do this guided or are we going to use a standard freehand approach? Are we going to immediate load the prosthesis by like kind of like tooth in a day or tooth in an hour? Or are we going to stage it traditionally? Are we going to be immediate placement? Are we going to take teeth out and immediately place the implants? Or are we going to let the areas heal and then place our implants? What type of materials are we going to use? Are we going to use resin or denture teeth? Are we going to use PMMAs? Or are we going to use zirconium? Are we going to do this graphless? Or are we going to do incorporate sinus augmentation? And then are we going to go directly to the implant, more or less a fixture level prosthesis? Or are we going to use multi-unit abutments? And I'm sure there's other areas of discussion, but for me, when I look at these, these are kind of the seven points that I think that are, are critical, and I look at these at every case prior to starting my case. I decide, what, what do I want to move along with? Where, what things do I feel are important for each individual, individual patient? But these seven areas are always something that I'm going to think about. So let's talk about discussion point number one. Are we going to go with four implants or greater than the four implants? For me, uh, it's not necessarily the number of implants, as much as it is about the quality of the bone and the AP um, direction. We want to know how much AP spread do we have. If we have a lot of AP spread and we have good bone, we can do different things. So in the typical case, the all-on-four concept as described by Malo, we're talking about four implants and we're talking about the posterior implants are going to be tilted. And that's kind of one of the hallmark approaches when we do this with four implants. And the main reason why we're tilting the implants is in order to, number one, avoid the sinus. At the same time, is to engage or increase that AP spread, which is so very critical.
And so this is kind of what our typical case would look like. In our maxillary patient, we would see that four implants. You see that the distal implants are placed uh, tilted and that the anterior implants are actually placed. And in this first x-ray on the left side, you can see that those are again, include multi-unit abutments. Now, when we look at the mandibular case, we see again, two posterior angled implants, again, anterior to the mental foramen, and then two actually placed implants in the, uh, in the anterior aspect of the mandible. And so again, that would be the classic um, all on four technique. The tight tilted implants are there to design to give us a better AP spread in our cases. If we go greater than four implants, and oftentimes what I may do is I'll go greater than four implants. If I have a lot of bone, I have a good AP spread, then I may be more inclined to place six implants actually. After placing implants actually for 20 years, it is very, very easy for me to place four, five, six, seven implants. Actually, when I place an all-on four case, I really have to kind of spend a lot of time in thinking about how am I going to place these implants. It is certainly not something that just commonly happens for me. By placing implants actually for years, again, trying to place my implants on a tilted manner is kind of just kind of tough for me. It's kind of hard for me to get my head around that. So again, I have a lot of implants. I have a lot of AP spread. I may more be more inclined um, to, again, place the implants in the actual position. So in this case, you can see we place five or six implants here, and then we're going to place them actually. Those are multi-unit abutments, and we're going to do a fixed detachable zirconium uh, uh, fabrication. This is what it's going to look like. Again, again, the, in this situation, we have five implants. They're actually placed. And again, it's going to be fixed, fixed and detachable prostheses. Second discussion point is, again, are we going to use uh, a, a CBCT? We can certainly use a CBCT and do the case standard. Or we could do a CBCT and then fabricated guided surgery by utilizing a surgical guides. We do know that if we do surgical guide therapy, that again, our flaps are going to be a little bit greater in order to attach and, and again, fixate the, uh, the guide. And again, our costs are going to be a little bit greater. Okay. At the same time, we can utilize a CBCT to know about how much bone we have, how much length of bone, how much height, how much width of bone, where is the reduction going to be needed when we do our, uh, our alveoloplasty. And then after we acquire that information, we could use a freehand approach, uh, whereas, which is in this uh, particular photograph, you can see that we use a little um, anterior um, uh, pilot hole where we then can place the surgical guide. We can then buy, uh, bend this titanium band, and then we can use that to kind of determine to place our implants at 30 to 45 degrees. This, I will be honest with you, is kind of the approach I take. So for me, I'm going to take a CBCT, our extract teeth, take a CBCT, determine my relationship between my incisal edge and the amount of space that I need, which is at least 15 millimeters between the incisal edge and the crest of the bone. I will at that point determine how much alveolocrustal bone loss I have to reduce in my alveoloplasty. Then I'll place this surgical guide and I'll usually, I tend to do my implants um, freehand. So for me, I'm more of an individual that I use CBC technology for the diagnosis and to determine what, what my own level of bone I have. I can then select my implants. And then when I actually do the surgery, I tend to utilize the freehand approach using this surgical guide. Again, and it allows me to do kind of less uh, or smaller flap reflection. And there's a little bit less cost because I'm not going through the expense of doing a lot of the, um, the surgical guides. The next thing is we're going to talk about is are we going to immediate load it or conventional loading? Now I'm kind of you know, and I practice in an area where I don't have a huge demand for the for the immediate load prosthesis. So I don't have a lot of people coming in and saying to me, you know, I want a fixed detachable prosthesis, you know, all in a day. So for the most part, what I find is that I'm kind of a traditionalist. So I may take the teeth out, put the implants in at the same time, put my multi-unit abutments in. But then I may, I probably most likely are not going to connect the prosthesis or their denture that day. I'm going to basically relieve their denture, and they're going to wear their denture again, typically for two to three months, and then I'm going to fabricate my prosthesis. So if patients request that, and they definitely want that uh, tooth in a day concept or teeth in a day concept. I'll do that with some basic ideas, and we'll talk about that. So generally speaking, for me, is that I'm going to take the teeth out. 
I'm going to place my implants and I'm not going to immediate load my cases. If I was going to immediate load my case, I'd be more likely to immediate load my cases in the mandible and in the maxilla. But again, typically I'm going to allow the areas to heal for about three to four months before I load the cases in the mandible and the maxilla. So that's kind of my personal preference on immediate loading. If I am going to immediate load, then I certainly want to acquire at least 35 newton centimeters of torque on my implant. So if I have four implants, I want to certainly test my torque values and make sure that I have torque values greater than 35 newton centimeters. Again, so if that's the case, we're going to certainly more likely use a um, certainly a more of an active aggressive thread pattern. So for me, it would be more like a legacy two type of implant where we have these reverse buttress threads or an active a thread design. So for me, if we're going to go immediate low, we certainly want to create a really good torque value and good primary fixation, they're going to handle high torque values so that we can immediately load the case. It's not as critical if we just are going to, again, use traditional uh, levels of, um, of, uh, of uh, loading times. Now, one thing I would suggest is that if you are going to do immediate load, one of the couple of the drawbacks with immediate load is that oftentimes um, people will say, oh, teeth in a day or teeth in an hour or, you know, I'm going to get my teeth right now, which is going to be great. And oftentimes they end up with their old denture or maybe with a new denture that's fixated to their implants. And sometimes we don't really est establish realistic expectations and patients kind of say, well, this is it. This is teeth in the day. This is what I end up getting. And so oftentimes they're not as excited as maybe you are because you spend a lot of time with that aspect. And, you know, you play, you take your teeth out, you place the implants, everything's going great. And now you spend a lot of time doing the conversion or you may have someone else helping you with the conversion. And it ends up spending a lot of time in this aspect. And in the end, the patient oftentimes is disappointed. You also find is that when we look at a lot of the complications that occur with the all on X concept is that again a lot of the complications is with the temporary or this immediate prosthesis that we deliver the day of the surgery. So we either end up having fractured prostheses or we end up with loose loose things or whatnot, which we have to actually have to fix. And so the feeling is is that if you're going to promise teeth in a day and you're going to do the conversion, you're going to do that, that you're certainly going to have to kind of be compensated for because it's going to add time at the time of your procedure as well as it's going to add time down the road because oftentimes you may have to, to monitor or fix things that are going to happen during that um, osseous integrative stage. So my suggestion is be realistic with your patients. If they're going to get that, say you're going to get a denture, either your old denture or a new denture when we do the conversion. And also say that if you want to do this, I'm going to have to add some um, some some dollars to the case in order to for make this worth all of our time. And many people talk about that extra case fee, maybe in the thousands to be realistic. So again, I think that if you want to do immediate load, certainly be aware that it does. Um, it's a nice service. Patients love it, but oftentimes um, there are also drawbacks to that. As far as doing implants in healed sites for versus immediate sites, I will tell you that I've kind of changed my feelings on these cases as time goes on. There's no doubt that placing implants in healed sites is just easier. You make an incision, you again draw, you, you fabricate your osteotomies, and again, you're probably going to always get great fixation. The ridge is nice and healed, and it's a much nicer case. And so if you can work in only healed sites, it's very nice. Um, I, so again, if you see a ridge like this, you've got good keratinized tissue, you've got a good alveolus, you can again make a nice alveoloplasty if you need to, and then you can place your implants and kind of everything sets up really nice. Okay, it's a little bit different when you do place these cases that are going to be an extraction socket. So you can see a nice mid-crustal mucoperiosteal flap, you make your flap, you can place your implants, you got good bone around your implants, you can test your torque values and probably everything is going to be ideal. Um, but a lot of people come in with situations like this where they, they want their teeth out, they need their teeth out, and you often may be inclined. Now what I've changed is that this type of case that you're looking at right now is kind of a case that I'm kind of moving away from. I'm very um, common to take out the teeth in the mandible and place my implants at the same time. In my maxillary cases, because the aesthetic zone is so important and the risk of not being dead on, is I'm more inclined now to take the teeth out, let the areas heal, then do my CBCT, 
And then, in, and then I have much more control where my incisal edge is, where that alveol, uh, alveol plastic needs to be. And so I'm more inclined to actually do my maxillary cases in healed sites. Take the teeth out, let the areas heal, or you can take the teeth out, do a, a alveol plasty, then bring them back for a CBCT, then figure out the amount of incisal edge that you need um, in order to have your, and then to perform your alveol plasty. And so I am more likely to stage that, to do work within healed sites in the maxilla, Whereas in the mandible, I'm more likely to take the teeth out, put the implants in. Again, I don't have that great uh, that greater risk in the aesthetic zone, and also I have much denser bone, and I always can get much better fixation. So this case that I might do that I did maybe a few years ago, take the teeth out, put the implants in, I'm kind of shying away from. Now in the maxilla, take the teeth out, let the area heal, do the CBCT, Make sure you set up all the final incisal edges and really make sure that your, your, that your aesthetics are all perfectly set up. And that's what's going to guide your alveoplasty. So for me, I'm staging my maxillary cases and I'm doing my implants more in the uh, he healed site as opposed to, let's say, this case where you look at the mandibular case. This is still my, my protocol. I'm going to take the teeth out. I'm going to place my implants. I'm going to probably place my multi-unit abutments. And then I'm still going to, again, not connect my denture. I'm still going to allow those areas to heal for a couple of months before I start the prosthesis. And I just find that this avoids a lot of the complications with the transitional. It saves me a lot of intraoperative time as far as not having to do that conversion. And that's just kind of my preference as I kind of work through this in my own practice. I'm trying to be as efficient as I possibly can, minimize my complications applications, meet my patient expectations, and for me, this is kind of how I'm managing these cases, at least from the surgical end. The next point is, which is also very important, is the point of what type of materials are we going to use, okay? And so, you know, again, there's a large population of patients um, and practitioners that are utilizing denture teeth on frameworks and also PMM, uh, PMNAs, which again are fabricated on sort of some sort of either titanium or cobalt chromium framework, and that's one group. And so the nice thing I like about it is that you can modify this, that the laboratory expense is a little bit more forgiving than doing zirconium. Um, it is modifiable, you can add material, you can change it, you can adjust it. Um, I love all those ideas of it. You need a little bit more alveoloplasty, you need a little bit more inner occlusal space because resin or PMA um, basically uh, gives you its, your strength through bulk. So in that case, you're going to need a little bit more bone reduction. Again, bone reduction is very, very important in order to, again, not see, as you can see on the screen, that transition. So it's very important. Zirconium, again, has a lot of, uh, is really what a lot of the prostheses are being made of today. The laboratory expense is more expensive. There's going to be more appointments. Uh, you're going to have a, a try-in, what we're going to talk about a little bit later in the case is that there's going to have to be a try-in with denture teeth. There's going to be a try-in with the PMNA. There's ultimately going, going to be scanning and then fabrication of the zirconium. So when you do zirconium prostheses, there's going to be some more appointments. So there's going to be more chair time side uh, time. There's going to be a higher cost. Um, once you fabricate or once you mill in zirconium, that's your final prosthesis, and you're not going to be willing or not wanting to do a lot of adjustment. It's almost virtually impossible to adjust zirconium. It's very difficult. So again, it's going to give new meaning to the try-in stage with denture teeth, it's going to give new meaning to the PMNA because those are going to be, again, you're going to want to be dead on. You want to make sure your incisal edge is perfect, that your, your E sound is perfect, that your M sound is perfect, that vertical dimension is, is perfect, and your centric relation is perfect. Because once you mill, you want to just put that in and say it's perfect. A little minor adjustment here or there, okay, but you don't want to not do any significant adjustments with your zirconium. So again, it brings new meaning to making sure that you're trying and your PMNA state is really on before you go to mill your zirconium. Um, zirconium is noisy. So if you have zirconium maxilla and a zirconium mandible and the patient talks, you, you can get a little clatter to that. So again, it's noisy. It's got great incisal strength. Um, it's aesthetically beautiful. It's slippery. Patients love it. But again, like any material, there's drawbacks. And so again, whatever decide, whatever material you decide on, zirconium, I seem to be more pro-zirconium only because I just feel that if you go from an overdenture 
to a fixed prosthesis, I feel that they kind of need something that's that's a little bit more, you know, more attractive, more more high end. And as a result, I tend to 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 gravitate towards the zirconium. So most of my patients, I'm going with zirconium just because I feel that it's kind of more of a high end prosthesis. So for me, I kind of feel that maybe they need more than let's say a denture tooth or a PMNA prosthesis. So again, that's personal preference and there's various people that all, have all different opinions. And again, I recommend everybody looks into all these different approaches and ultimately make these decisions on these, um, on these discussion points. And again, you can see that when we do the final prosthesis, the zirconium, you can see it's very streamlined. There's no palate. It's nice and smooth and slippery. It's, it's a beautiful prosthesis. And again, you can fill the uh, access holes with um, with material um, and uh, with composite, and again, the patients really, really love this prosthesis. Um, again, one of the big point, next discussion points is: Are we going to do sinus augmentation or graftless? And for for the most part, most people are really trying to get away from, let's say, these high end um, technique sensitive procedures like like lateral walls to create sinus augmentation, like Tatum approaches, um, and then doing doing implants. So with the graphless approach with the fixed detachable, we can again avoid doing these types of processes that carry, you know, a higher level of expertise, more complications, and more issues. So again, um, that's what the that the procedure kind of allows us to do is to get away from this sinus augmentation. As you can see, when our typical graphless case, we're going to angle the implants again away from the sinus, maybe engage in the anterior wall of the sinus, and then our anterior implants are going to uh, again be placed actually trying to engage as much bone as we possibly can. The next level is talking, are we going to go with a fixture level impression or a multi-unit abutment impression? Well, I think that if we look at the mandibular cases, in the mandibular cases, um, for the most part, you probably could go right to a one-piece implant that has kind of like the multi-unit abutment almost already incorporated within to the implant, like a, like a one-piece implant that you can get, um, the direct um, implant that you can get, like that uh, certainly that um, implant direct has, you can go directly for that. And, I, and I'm a big believer in that, especially in the mandibular cases. In my maxillary cases, I tend to use the multi-unit abutments because I want to, once I place the implants, um, I, I really would, I really want that screw hole to come through the, either the occlusal surface or come through the, uh, of my posterior teeth or come through the palatal aspect of my, of my anterior teeth. Um, for years, you know, when I did these cases back 10, 15, 20 years ago before we had these uh, multi-unit abutments, it was not uncommon to have screw holes coming through the facial surface of our maxillary anterior teeth, which we then would fill with composite and they would take on stain. And patients didn't really like it. With the advent of utilizing these multi-unit abutments, we can really place the implants in bone, redirect the uh, screw hole, and again, end up with a very aesthetic uh, looking prosthesis. So for me, fixture level uh, in the mandible is not a problem. Uh, Multi-unit abutments is kind of what I utilize in my maxillary cases. And I try, and I'm pretty much for the most part, have gotten away from going right to the fixture level, actually at the, at the um, let's say the hex connection, um, or at the same time going with a with a one piece implant where where you um, um, can go directly to the implant but not within the hex but within a platform which would be synonymous or look very similar to the multi unit abutment. I think it's a little bit more technique sensitive. If you have a one piece implant, you have to make sure that the that that implant ends up being on the palatal side of the of the crest. Um, so that, again, you don't have to worry about having those excess screw holes coming through the facial aspect in the maxillary cases. So, again, a lot of people have different feelings on that. Look into it, make decisions. I'm a multi-unit abutment guy, definitely in the maxillary cases. I can go either way in the mandible, either multi-unit abutments or a one-piece implant. I don't really think that you kind of is a big issue in the mandibular cases just by the position of the implants and because you're not really in the aesthetic zone. And very seldom are you ever going to have your your access in a screw hole coming through the uh, facial aspect of the mandibular arch cases. So again, that's kind of where I where I stand on that on those particular cases. So what I want to do is spend the next um, 15 minutes kind of going through a case. So you know, Kevin was a is a 60 year uh, four year old male that that presented to my office. Um, he's a chef, uh, rather kind of a a, a big guy. Um, 
and really concerned uh, mainly about his teeth. I can tell you that when he opens his mouth, I can actually move those those three remaining teeth. There's virtually no bone or, around it. Um, he's not happy with his aesthetics. He's worried about his relationship. And um, he said, you know, Doc, I really want to want to do something different. You know, I really need to to get healthier. Um, I want to eat healthier. I, 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 I'm a chef. I, I cook all day. Uh, I can't eat anything that I make. I have to eat everything that's soft. And and uh, a very emotional guy, you know, almost has a difficult time talking about it. And um, certainly uh, uh, this is what I see as really the patient pool. These are the patients I think that we're going to more commonly treat are the patients that come in in this baby boomer group that have, let's say, four, five, six remaining teeth that do not want to wear dentures. They really perceive those as their, their maybe their parents or their grandparents. They're very nervous about the concept of wearing a denture. They want their teeth restored. And I think this patient is a much more easier patient to treatment plan than a typical patient that comes in who's been wearing dentures for 10, 15 years. Those people have kind of, they're kind of okay with the way they are and they're gonna kind of continue with that. Maybe they would go with over dentures. This is the population of patients that I think the 30s, maybe the maybe the 40s, the 50s, the 60 year old people that are just afraid to actually go down that um, that uh, removable denture roll. So this is um, this is what Kevin looks like when he smiles. You know, he's not showing any anterior teeth. He shows a little tooth uh, on the mandible. And so, um, you know, he's smiling here, but certainly uh, doesn't show any teeth. You know, we expect, we for me, when a patient does the E sound or smiles, I want to see 100% of their teeth. I see zero teeth here. So, um, you know, I, I want to certainly know that. We have to certainly, you know, enhance his, his feeling. As you can see, his mandible, He's about six teeth. He has some broken teeth off. He's missing some posterior teeth, and um, he's not wearing uh, anything. He's not wearing partials. He's not wearing anything. So for me, you know, again, this is uh, one of the earlier cases that I did. You know, we're going to take a periapical X-ray, and, and I still tend to be on uh, my first X-ray. A lot of times that I'll take a pan. Um, this is even before. Uh, this is going back a bunch of years ago, even before I had, you know, the CBCT, or I had um, that I was utilizing uh, even, uh, uh, you know, basic um, digital X-ray. So this is one of the earlier cases. So for me, I fabricate some uh, some sort of diagnostic guide. I put a little B BB to kind of determine, I'm putting those BBs in, in the maxilla to determine where the anterior wall of the sinus is. And then in my mandible, I'm going to put those BBs kind of where I'm thinking um, from a panoramic point of view, where is the mental foramen? So I've been utilizing this type of approach, and I still kind of use this approach even today with the digital x-rays as well as with the CBCT. I kind of still use this as kind of my preliminary um, uh, diagnostic aid. I want to know how what is going to be my AP spread? Where is the anterior aspect of the sinus? And then where is my mental foramen? And so we're going to place this, and we're going to take a, again, take a, um, a panoramic x-ray. Now, again, like I was saying, this is one of my first cases, and at this point, I was really, I, I, I'm a strong believer because I, I'm board certified in implant dentistry. I do the surgical and the restorative aspect all in my office. So at this time, this is one of my earlier cases, and at that point, I would take the teeth out, I would do my veoplasty, and I'd place my implants. And so again, before we show this, and we didn't show this, is that we already at this time have, have again, fabric, taken our maximum interview relationship, We've a set teeth. We've done a try-in with a as many teeth as we possibly can, and we have fabricated a an immediate denture. And not only have we immediately uh, established our immediate denture, but in a standard approach, we also have modified um, that immediate denture. And I've duplicated the immediate denture in the duplicate. I've duplicated into clear acrylic, and off of the clear acrylic denture, I've modified the uh, the part of it in order to tell me exactly where I need to do my alveoloplasty. So I put that in their mouth. I actually have a window fabricated. And then from that window, I want to make sure that I'm going to reduce the alveolar crest so that the window that I created more in the buccal vestibule area is so where I know exactly where my modification is. Now, if you do this guided surgery, it can help you with this. If you want to do your CBCT, it's also going to make that alveoloplasty. But again, the alveoloplasty is probably one of the most critical aspects of the surgical aspect. Placing four implants is going to be one of the easiest aspects of the procedure. Placing tilted implants is a little bit harder, especially if you've been placing implants for a long time. But essentially, 
the alveoplasty is really the most important aspect. We want to make sure that we reduce the crust so that ultimately when that patient's prosthesis is fabricated, you're not going to see that, um, that transition between the soft tissue and the prosthesis. So for me, you can use a whole host of different instrumentation. I'm going to, ra I'm going to take my teeth out. I'm going to raise a flap. I'm going to modify the ridge either with a, a big, like a Pico spur where I can reduce the crest, or again, if I need a little areas of reduction, I might use an eight round burr just in a high speed and reduce the crest down. It depends on really the amount of volume of bone reduction that I need. If I need a great amount of it, I'm going to use a much more aggressive. If there's just a little bit of, let's say, interseptal or inner um, dental uh, bone, then I can just remove that with any type of um, uh, in instrumentation. This is kind of what I utilize again is again as you can see because I'm doing this case freehand I'm going to make a little eight millimeter long two by, by two millimeter osteotomy I'm going to place this little um, standard uh, surgical guide I place that right in the midline either in the mandible or in the maxilla I then can bend this little titanium um, band to conform with the position of the arch. And then I can use that um, because there are basically vertical lines on this that you may not be able to see on your screen. But then you can actually angle the distal abutment or the anterior uh, or the anterior implants in the position to create your your tilted implants, or you can place them in an axial position. Once you do that and you create your osteotomies, again we're going to go with longer implants. So again, we're more likely to be using 16 millimeter implants in 13 millimeters. So really, we're looking at using implant lengths that are going to be aggressive thread designs, uh, compressive thread designs. Um, we're going to, again, try to be using longer implants, again, to give us better anchorage and better, better fixation. Uh, and then once we place the implants, then this is when I incorporate the multi-unit abutments. And with our multi-unit abutments that we have uh, with Implant Direct, they have these little white transfers. And those, will again, give you the idea when you place your uh, multi-unit abutment onto your implant, you can then look at these white little guys and say, okay, are my, are my, um, is the multi-unit abutment um, proceeding uh, palatally, mesially? I mean, we don't want them to be moving, we don't want the multi-unit abutments to be moving in a facial direction or even a distal direction. I kind of want to be able to have all of my multi-unit minutes abutments kind of moving palatally and mesely. So it's easy for me to place my screws and have them all not in the aesthetic zone. We want to get that away. So again, Whereas now, I probably would do this a little differently. This is still the concept. Take the teeth out, place the implants, place my multi-unit abutments, move that hex in whatever direction you want in order to get those, those uh, positioning of those multi-unit abutments to proceed both palatally and more of an amusial, amusial position. And then again, um, it's graphless in the sense that we're not doing um, a, a sinus augmentation, but if I do extraction of the teeth and I put the implants in at the same day, I'm certainly, I, I still end up grafting the, um, the gap between the implant and the uh, socket walls. And again, we're going to favor more of a palatal approach if we can. And again, amazingly, I'm going to be utilizing platelet-rich plasma, and I'm going to miss that with a mineralized irradiated bone, which uh, kind of is like the direct gem material that what I use um, at uh, Implant Direct. So a mineralized irradiated bone, I mix it with platelet-rich plasma, and I fill my gap in all in that area. Obviously, if you do this in healed sites, you're not going to have to most likely do any gap, any uh, grafting at all. Again, it's graphless in the sense that we're not, or that we're not doing, um, that we're not doing sinus surgery, but we're still grafting our sockets uh, around our implants. We're grafting our gap, and so this is kind of a very, very common approach for me. Um, at that point, obviously, you know, for me, I'm going to place all four implants. I place my posterior implants first. And then I place my anterior implants um, in the axial position. And I'm going to graft again all around my implants. I don't need to graft in the other areas because for the most part, I'm probably reducing the ridge in all my cases anyway, except in these really atrophic cases. In that case, maybe an avioplasty is not even necessary. Again, that's all going to be based on your panoramic x-ray or your CBCT. And then for me, where many people then might elect to, do, to then do their, their conversion and connect the denture, uh, like I said earlier, this is a stage that I don't find to be um, 
all that demanded by my patients. And so I'm gonna then put these little comfort caps onto the multi-unit abutments. I'm gonna take their new their immediate denture. I'm gonna relieve this area. And then I'm gonna do some sort of co-soft material. And the patient's gonna go home with a removable denture um, for about two months. And at two months, I'll start to fabricate the prostheses. So again, on the first day after the first surgery, this is what the patient's gonna go home with. They're gonna go home with, again, a, a uh, a denture and at that stage and at this point we can also again um, we can we can utilize and we can look at this prosthesis and say okay do I love exactly where everything looks and again you really want to again focus before you go to surgery that you are very happy with the aesthetics of the case uh, in this particular case, again, after we did this, we then went to the mandible. I tend to do the maxillary aspect first, if I can, only because we usually need more healing times because of the quality and quantity of the bone of the maxilla. So in the mandible, uh, we then go to the mandible. We bilaterally block the patient. We'll take out the teeth. We'll then usually do our muco, a full mucoperiosteal flap with a mid-crustal incision, reflect. I don't have to reflect as much because, again, I'm not doing guided surgery with utilizing a, um, a, a surgical guide. And then, as you can see, then I'm going to advance the implants in a, um, and again, in that tilted manner. And again, I'm going to use most likely use some sort of either a legacy two design, more of an aggressive um, uh, pattern. And of course, implant direct has every type of implant, whether you like, if, if you're a Nobel person, or if you're a Strauman person, or if you're a Sweden Martin or BioHorizons, again, implant ha implant direct has, you know, again, all the surfaces and all of the, um, all the designs and the uh, thread designs of whatever implant design you want to utilize. For me, um, I'm more of a, um, you know, a legacy one or a legacy two person, depending on the type of prosthesis that I'm working on. And then for me, for the most part, I'm placing all my implants by hand. I'm using a ratchet. I'm going to slowly advance my implant and, again, uh, feel for the quality of the bone. Okay, because I want to kind of know how, how strong the bone is. And in this case, again, we can place our, in this case, we can place the cover screws or, or the, and let it heal naturally. Or again, you can again place the, um, the multi-unit abutments. Now, for the most part, I'm going to try to take the teeth out, place the implants in the mandible and the multi-unit abutments. But again, everything is about biology. So there's no... I always do it this way or I always do that way. I mean, if the bone is soft and I don't have great fixation, then I'll place cover screws on and I'll bone graft around my implants and I'll, and I'll cover the implants. If I have great bone and really strong fixation, then I'll put the multi-unit abutments on. So again, what I do for every particular case really is dictated to me by A, the quality of the bone, the fixation that I have, the quantity of the bone I have, the length of the implants, uh, and, and, and ultimately, um, uh, that that's what's going to govern how I really maintain these cases. So it's not like every patient gets this, every patient gets that. Uh, again, I'm really thinking more about biologic biology as well as the biomechanics. So again, that's what that's what's really governed how I approach these cases. Even though ideally I'd like to take the teeth out, put the implants in, put the multi-unit unit abutments in, and have the patient go home and start to heal, so that I don't have to do any additional surgeries. I try to do everything in one surgery as I can in the mandible, in the maxilla. I tend to still stage it because I think the aesthetic zone is so critical that you, you know, to me to try to do everything in one time, um, you may end up missing the boat and really regret it. So for me, I tend to stage those max rate cases. This is what the case looks like. Again, we're not getting primary closure in these cases. Uh, what you see there is you see the case um, sutured up with horizontal mattress sutures. And what you see is the platelet rich fibrin barrier. So I'll, I'll draw blood, I use platelet rich fibrin, and I, that'll actually, what I'll do is cover over the implants or even cover over the, uh, again, if I, uh, if I go with the multi-unit abutments, again, they're going to be super, they're going to be a super gingival and you'd be actually see those. But in this particular case, for whatever reason, I placed uh, healing cover, uh, cover screws, bone grafted, placed my platelet rich fibrin over the top of it and then use horizontal mattress sutures. And this is what the case looks like, uh, again, at the time after we placed our, our implants, we have the four implants placed in the in the mandible, and we have four implants placed in the maxilla. We ended up going with, again, and I think that on the maxillary left, I can think, I think I placed that implant, the bone was kind of soft, I didn't have really good fixation, so as a result, rather than placing the multi-unit abutment, I just placed the cover screw. And again, it's all about quality of bone, quantity of bone, biomechanics, and how much I have to graft. That's what dictates to me whether I um, place multi-unit abutments or, or not. 
And again, at the end of that, we end up with the patient with maximum mandibular dentures. And again, they're relieved, they're co-soft, and the patient's going to wear this for two or three months until we start the prosthetic aspect. This is what the patient looks like now um, at prosthesis. So this is probably about two months in the in the mandible. And you can see we have the multi-unit abutments in the uh, posterior implants. And then you're looking at the internal connection of the uh, anterior implants that are actually placed. Uh, uh, and then now when I move into the prosthesis, what I place now is I want to do two things. So when I take my impression, what I like to do is I place these individual transfers uh, that have some resin attached to them, and then I'll connect those with some sort of uh, core paste or some sort of resin material. So what I do is I will connect all those once I, once I screw those in, I connect those, and essentially that's the impression of the implants. And then I'll pick that all up with a polyvinyl selexane material, which really I'm using just to capture my soft tissue. So my angulation and position of my implants are going to be tra are being are being uh, uh, captured with these little transfers, uh, open transfers, and these little uh, little triad jigs. I'll connect those all together. That's going to be my impression of the position and angulation of the implants. And then I'm going to pick up that entire. Um, for uh, implants uh, transfers with some transfer material. So this is an open tray. I block that out with a little bit of cotton. And then I'm going to use, I, for me, I use a heavy bodied polyvinyl selexane. And you can see on the left side, I'm going to connect those jigs all together. So essentially, I'm taking my impression of the implants by that jig right there. And I'm going to capture my soft tissue by utilizing the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, open tray technique with the pilot vinyl selexane and an imprint three material. And so this is kind of what it looks like in the patient's mouth. You can see that now I pull off the con, the material is, uh, has changed. I now have access to my screw holes and I'm gonna use my hex tool and I'm gonna relieve the entire and again, remove the entire impression. And then I'll have actually my implant analogs that are the analogs that correspond to the multi-unit abutments. And then I will screw those in. I don't have to worry about um, those those uh, those transfers moving because they are rigidly fixed together with the um, with the uh, prosthesis. Uh, they're rigidly fixed together with the with the uh, resin material, uh, and that's what the case looks like. I'll then send that to the lab. Uh, I'll place back my uh, co uh, comfort caps onto the onto the uh, implants, uh, multi unit abutments, and again the patient leaves with the um, with the uh, uh, soft relined denture. Again, we do the same exact thing in the maxilla. You're looking at the multi-unit abutments. We place our open tray transfers on. We have these um, triad um, little jigs. We're going to connect them all with some sort of core paste material or some sort of light cured resin material. That's going to capture the angulation and position of our implants. And then I'm going to pick up the entire thing with um, with a polyvinyl selexane material. And I find by doing this, we virtually have a passive prosthesis, and that's kind of the most important thing. This is now showing you the open tray. And again, we're now looking at the impression. And again, with the um, impression material now is, is being captured with the um, polyvinyl selexane material. And again, you can then um, have your all on four and then they can fabricate. The Mars. Now the next the next appointment, you're going to confirm. They're going to send you a verification jig, and you want to confirm that your prosthesis is passive. The most important thing for this prosthesis to last for the long haul or for the long term is that we know that this final prosthesis has to screw in passively. So we're going to screw in one distal um, screw, and we hope that the entire jig doesn't move. We want it to sit passively on the platforms of these of these prostheses. And that's the most important part of the prostheses that we can just screw in this um this prosthesis without any force. And passivity is one of the hardest things to achieve. And that's why too and this type of impression really works. Now if you scan prostheses and that's a whole different com uh, a conversation, um again we expect that passivity is going to be achieved by using scanning and that type of approach too. At that point, we confirm that we have a passive jig, that our impression was accurate. We're then going to take our maximum and relationship. We can do that because we can, again, screw in our, 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 our mandibular and maxillary um, wax rims, and we can take our maximum and relationship. And then, like I said earlier, this is denture construction. You take your impression, you confirm that the jig fits. You're again you're going to do your maximum injury relationship. After your maximum injury relationship, that same visit, you're going to pick a shade 
for the teeth. You're going to, I like the Ivoclar blue line shade. I like to do that. A1 is popular. A2 is great. You also want to do a gingival shade. You're going to have to now get a gingival shade because there is going to be a gingival shade component of your hybrid prosthesis. So that's something that oftentimes we forget. So gingival shade, tooth shade, very important when you the day you confirm that your jig is accurate or that your that your impression is accurate, and then you move on to the next level. And then again, patient goes home that day. Next visit, we're going to try and uh, again they're they're uh, trying make sure they like their teeth, make sure the occlusion is great. And after that, we then can fabricate a prosthesis in your PMNA. And so now what I like to do is I'll have my PMNA fabricated. I'll screw it in. I'll check everything. I'll check the occlusion. I'll check the incisal edge. I'll ask the patient, do you like the way they look? And I let them go home and wear this for one week. I don't let them wear it many longer than that because, again, there's no framework. This is just pure PMNA. If they wear it too long, they get excited. They start to chew, and they can break it. And again, it's kind of a setback. If you do that, you have to refabricate it. So I let them wear it for about three to four days, sometimes a week at the most. Patients, when they know what they like, they immediately like it. If they go home and they say, oh, they immediately know the teeth are too long, they're too big to do this or do that. So again, PMNA as well as the denture trying is very important. You want to make sure the patient is perfectly happy before you scan this and then go to your zirconium prosthesis. So for me, I'll tighten down the PMNA. I tighten down the screws about 20 Newton centimeters with an adjustable torque wrench, and I don't really fill up my access holes. I let them go home and wear this for just a handful of days. Let them smile, talk, look at their spouse, their friends, and get a feel, do I like this? Do I look good? If not, that's when you want to start modifying this. Do your trying stage on denture teeth or with your PMNA. And this is their PMNA. He's then going to go home, and he's going to kind of, um, wear it and see if he likes it. And this is what it looks like. Again, it's going to look very similar to the eventual um, zirconium. We screw it in, we torque them down 20 newton centimeters, and I let the patient go home just like this. Now, again, when they come back, what I tend to do is if they like it, I unscrew it, I uh, scan it, and I screw it back in the same day. And you can see if you were going to just do it in denture teeth or just do a PMNA, you would essentially be done. If you go to zirconium, you're going to need an extra couple appointments. One, to take it out of their mouth and rescan the process. At least this is how I do it. I know there's a lot of different people that have different approaches, but for me, I take the prosthesis out, my lab scans it, or we scan it, and then we put it back in their mouth. And then again, the next time they see us is we're going to have the final zirconium. So this is it comes back at the case. There's zirconium prosthesis. This is what it looks like. Again, we want to see the excess holes coming through the, ming, the lingual aspect or the palate aspect or, or possibly the occlusal aspect. This is what the final prosthesis looks like. And at this point, we really hope that we're doing almost zero modification. Touch it here or touch it there is okay, but we certainly want to do not want to do any gross adjustments on these prostheses. It's just not, it's not, it's just too much work. This is what the final prosthesis looks like. We want to make sure that when he smiles, he's not showing the the um, again the transition at all. This is what it looks like from the uh, occlusal view, and I will then torque this down 20 newton centimeters. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. And then what we'll do is we then this is we'll take our final X-ray. We'll uh, then fill the access holes with some cotton, and when we'll place the um, the uh, I'll use a flowable composite and polish it. And this is what the final prosthesis looks like. We'll have a little longer cantilever in the mandible because the quality and density of the bone. A little shorter, uh, again, a cantilever on the maxillary. And if you can get away with no cantilever, even better in the maxilla. This is what the final patient, this is what the final case looks like. And this is the day I screw this in. And you can see that, you know, Kevin was emotional that day. And that's one thing I will say about the all on, uh, all on X concept of the fixed detachable that this really is life altering. And this definitely changes people's lives. It's very different than doing, let's say, a single implant. I mean, these patients get very emotional. And you know, for me, when I put this in his mouth, I said, let me, you know, I want to take a picture. It was hard for him to kind of hang, you know, you know, keep back the the tears and the and the emotions. And and that's what really this type of prosthesis brings to 
to to the doctor or the clinician. This is truly a win-win. It's it's it is a labor of love. There is work involved. I mean, this is not something that is necessarily easy to do, but with thought and, and understanding the basic principles of implantology, um, you can end up with a great prosthesis and really change people's lives and, and they can really go out. This is what happens with these types of cases. And so these cases are, are unique. They're great. They change people's lives. Um, they change your life. I mean, they change the dentist's life. The more of these cases that I do, the more cases I want to do because I really see the end result. And a lot of these patients, they come in, they're kind of beaten down, they're um, depressed, they, they feel bad about it, and um, you can really change their lives. Um, so again, you know, my recommendations really is definitely spend a lot of time on the diagnosis, spend a lot of time on the treatment plan, make sure that you know exactly how the case you really want it to look like before you go to surgery. And then just be very organized and be strict on your protocols, but always keep in mind um, how important the bone quality is, how important the aesthetics are, and as far as uh, and how important it is to really understand that before you start to do your cases. I just want to say that this is my email. We are going to take some questions. Okay, so one of the questions is, for me, as far as what lab am I using, I'm using a local lab. I use uh, what its lab is known as Utica Dental Lab. Uh, Utica Dental Lab is in Utica, New York. Um, Matt Wiggin is the owner. He's the individual that I've been working with for the last few years on the zirconium fixed detachable. Um, and again, there's a whole host of people that are in this arena. He does a great job with me, and um, we've been doing that. I uh, One of the questions is, if, have I ever had any zirconium full restoration fractures or fractures on the metal hubs to the zirconium adhesive? Um, well, number one, I have never had any zirconium um, prosthesis fracture. One of the good things about zirconium is that the incisal edge strength of zirconium is very good. I will tell you, though, I have had one of the things about zirconium, and this is one of one of the um, disadvantages, is, is that the, the, the metal hubs or the cylinders are cemented into the zirconium and then that whole aspect is screwed into the into the uh, multi-unit abutments. And I have had a cement fatigue in the earlier cases. So what happens essentially is the patient comes in with the zirconium in their hand, which obviously is a very, um, you know, um, uh, sad day when that happens. And so what I've done is now is that our labs now um, – are using a much stronger cement. And so obviously when you use cement and when you use screws, that's going to be your weak link to your to your prosthesis. So I've had no fractures of the of the um of the zirconium fracture, but I have had um cement fatigue on the cylinders. And basically what I've done very similarly is that usually everything is on the multi-unit abutments. You can actually just apply the cement right into the internal aspect of the zirconium bridge and just cement it right back in position um, and it's and it's worked really, really well. Have you ever fabricated a hybrid prosthesis attached to five implants or implants with a locator attachment? So now, for me, for the most part, um, the question is, um, have I used a hybrid prosthesis with implants uh, with locator attachments? So um, what I would say is that um, for the most part, uh, if I'm going to do use locators, I tend to use those with a bar prosthesis, so a removable prosthesis. So what I like to do in this situation is um, if a patient goes removable, I'm more likely to fabricate a CAD CAM bar, and on that CAD CAM bar, I'll have locator attachments, and then it's more of a removable approach. So I do that all the time. Matter of fact, you know, for many, many years, you know, the option was a overdenture, and the next other option, the fixed option, was the, the classic cement uh, metal uh, prosthesis. So you went from a prosthesis that might be in the neighborhood of about fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars for an arch to go to the next level. You were talking about thirty-five to forty-five thousand dollars, and so it was such a huge leap that as a result, we just did so many overdentures. I mean, for the most part, you know, I was doing, you know, more overdentures than any other prosthesis because it really worked for many people's uh, financial situation. So for me, as far as the locator aspect, that's my overdenture patient with a CAD CAM design bar with locator attachments. And I do that on four implants. I'll do that on five implants. Um, 
And usually, um, you know, if I'm going to use single solitary locators, that's usually going to be only utilizing that in the mandibular arch. I'll put two implants in with locators without a bar, but it's for my mandibular overdenture patient. So one of the questions is, how do I ensure the provisional denture doesn't hinder implant uh, healing? Um, and so how do we make sure the denture isn't sliding around in the implants? Well, well, first of all, you know, what, we, what I basically do is I'm going to play, and this is really how I treat, you know, whether it's an overdenture case or whether it's fixed detachable cases, you know, um, or even if small diameter implants or any, any one piece implant where we're going to have the implant protruding through the soft tissue. So, you know, first of all, a little bit of, of movement or a little bit of um, load on the implants is not a bad thing. It's just when we have excess load that we'll see failure. So even if the denture is hitting the implants just a little bit, it's, it certainly doesn't mean that we're going to get a fibrous encapsulization. So what I generally do is I'm going to place my multi-unit abutments. I'm going to then place my heal, my comfort caps, like those white comfort caps. I'm then going to utilize, I'll maybe express a little bit of my uh, blue bite registration material. I put that in the patient's mouth. I'll see exactly where my healing caps are. And then I'll really very aggressively relieve the denture. Once I relieve the denture, I'll confirm it with some PIP paste, and then I'll actually place my denture, and then I'll relieve it even more, and then I'll use some sort of co-soft material, and then I'll actually relieve even the co-soft material where the actual co-caps, uh, comfort caps are. And by I've been doing this for probably over 20 years, and for the most part, I've had really good success without not having, uh, again, you know, overly having over micro movement or whatnot. So, um, you know, I've really, you know, been very happy with that, and I haven't had any problems. So, um, another question is, is a soft night guard recommended to protect the prosthesis? So, one of the drawbacks to a fixed prosthesis, um, the question is, should we make a, a night guard for these patients? Well, one of the drawbacks of a fixed prosthesis among a patient that grinds or clenches their teeth, or mainly grinding their teeth, is that, again, they're going to be creating a lot of lateral forces on that prosthesis as they sleep. We know that lateral forces on implants is a deleterious um, effect on, on our implants. So you can certainly make a night appliance or a soft tissue, a soft appliance so that rather than, again, going through these these uh, and going through these interferences through these la lateral excursions by then allowing them to slide kind of effortlessly across their uh, zirconia uh, prosthesis is again going to prevent a lot of that lateral load that we have. So you certainly can fabricate a soft night guard to protect the prosthesis or more importantly, I'm not really worried about protecting the prosthesis because the zirconia is very strong. I'm more worried about creating stress to the crest where we're going to see some crustal bone loss, or maybe by you know doing a lot of grinding, maybe create that cement fatigue, or maybe loosening up screws. So I'm more concerned more about that than actually breaking the prosthesis as much as cement fatigue, screw loosening, or or even worse yet, um, forces again at the crest and then seeing our crustal bone loss. Again, in patients that have severe clenching or grinding or or real lateral force destruction, these these may be patients that we say. Forget fixed prostheses. Maybe we should go with an overdenture. Because see, with the overdenture patient, you can say at night, just take, the, just take them out. You know, take the overdentures out. And people very seldom are going to close so far that they're going to grind on a CAD CAM bar. So, you know, one of the questions is, what is the maintenance involved with zirconium? You know, for me, um, you know, the maintenance, I think that, you know, for me, once we place this prosthesis in the mouth, um, we have our patients come in. Um, for the most part, I'm going to have them using a, um, you know, a water pick. You know, again, you're, you're, you're not going to have any significant food that's going to get under these. These passively sit on the soft tissue, so you're not going to get big chunks of food that you may get in an overdenture or conventional denture, but you are certainly going to get a little bit of debris that can work its way, or material elbow that's going to work its way underneath. So we give everybody an electric toothbrush, we give them a water pick, and they can rinse and, and water pick really good. I have them come in in about three months just to see, because they certainly can form calculates or tartar on the the lingual aspects or parallel aspects of these prostheses. So I have them come in in three months. 
see what the buildup is, see what the tartar looks like, and then we make an evaluation how often do we see, the, see these patients. We give them a, a, um, a, a water pick, and we give them a night, um, again, a, a, um, a, as a prosthesis that they want to clean as best as we possibly can. Okay, so one of the questions is, is natural teeth with opposing zirconium implant denture, is it recommended? It seems to me that that when I look at my patients, um, it seems like I have basically, I've done it almost in all different ways where I've had zirconium, uh, a zirconium fixed detachable zirconium in the maxilla with an overdenture on the bottom. I've had, again, both bilaterally, but where I've had maxillary um, uh, fixed detachable on the maxilla as well as zirconium fixed detachable on the, on the, um, in the mandible. I've done it uh, natural teeth in the mandible with zirconium on the, um, in the maxilla. So quite honestly, I've done it all different ways. Um, some people prefer to actually change it up, meaning they have zirconium in one arch. I would tend to put that in the maxilla because I think it looks a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. But people have selected to use, let's say, prosthetic teeth or denture teeth on the mandible because, again, it's a little bit less noisy. Because when you put zirconium against zirconium, you, again, you get more, um, more clatter, more noise. So, again, you have a kind of a um, more of a softer touch if you have zirconium against a natural uh, denture teeth or zirconium versus a PMNA. So um, some people um, do it, will change the uh, materials just to make it a little bit more of a quieter um, prosthesis. So, but you certainly can have natural teeth versus zirconium. Obviously there's zirconium crowns that become very popular and they're usually being opposed by natural teeth in most situations. So um, that's certainly become um, very common. And I would just say as far as in closing is that um, again, I can't stress enough the diagnostic aspect. I think it's very important that number one, you really become to love fabricating a denture concept because spending time on knowing where the incisal edge is and where the E sound is and when the, when the patient says E, you need to know, you know, do they show their gums? Um, do they have a gummy smile? How much bone reduction is important? Where do I want to place it inside the ledge? That's really important. That's probably the most important thing. Knowing where that is before you start the procedure is so critical. And then from that inside the ledge position, you then can do your alveoloplasty, place your implants, and at that point, then it's just a question of going through the steps of taking the impression and then you know, confirming that your impression is accurate, doing your maximum endeavor relationship, trying in your teeth, having the patient wear their PMNA for a little bit of time, and then again, then go into zirconium uh, if that's what you choose as your material. And then thinking about those areas of discussion, deciding where you want to go with all those areas of discussion, and making sure that before you start, you know, this is what I'm going to ultimately do. If you do it yourself, obviously, you're going to be in complete control of the case. If you're working in a team approach with a, with a surgeon, then again, you want to make sure that this is what I want to do. Communicate that well with your, with your surgeon, and then you're going to end up with a very, very uh, happy result. You're going to have a nice positive outcome, and you're going to meet patient expectations.